You have fallen into Event Horizon with John Michael Godier. In today's episode, John is joined by Amir Siraj. Amir studies astrophysics at Harvard University and is interested broadly in theoretical astrophysics. He is a Goldwater Scholar and U.S. Presidential Scholar. He is co-president of Harvard Students for the Exploration and Development of Space and former senior U.S. editor of the Harvard Political Review. His research advisor is Professor Abraham Loeb. I have talked to you in the past about Masterworks, a revolutionary fintech company that makes multi-million dollar paintings investable to the public. And with the uncertainty of today's market, the Fed raising rates, and the wild downswings of the currently crazy stock market. This is the best time to make sure you have a diversified portfolio. So why aren't? In 2019, Sosby sold Yoshimoto Nara's knife behind back for a record-setting 25 million in Hong Kong. Since that sale, Arch News has labelled Nara as an in-demand staple in international contemporary art auctions. What Masterworks does is buy artwork like Picasso, Monet, or Yoshito Nara, and works with the SEC to securitize the paintings which allow you to buy shares as an investment. Signing up for Masterworks is easy. Go to the site by clicking on the link in the description, then click Skip the Waiting List. You can be confident that Masterworks knows what they're doing when it comes to selling art. In fact, they returned 32% to their investors in 2020 and 31 in 2021. Once you've signed up, you'll have the opportunity to have a phone call with one of Masterworks experts. These experts will explain the various markets available and how each one has appreciated over the years. So go ahead and take advantage of this opportunity now to immediately start investing in this blue chip art by clicking the link below or by going to masterworks.art forward slash event horizon. And when you do, you directly help to support this channel. Amir Siraj, welcome back to the program. Thanks for having me again on the show, John. Now, Amir, you, your your latest paper has, or your latest work has captivated me. The idea of interstellar material, not in our solar system and passing through, but sitting here on Earth where we can study it. Tell us the story of what, <laughs> what led to this discovery that an interstellar meteor had entered Earth's atmosphere. <laughs> yeah, so this is, this is a... Uh long story in fact it, it it took about three years to unfold um so my my involvement with this meteor started back in april 2019 um my advisor avi Loeb, had brought this this database of meteor fireballs called the cneos database which stands for uh, Center for Near Earth Object Studies. It's hosted um, at NASA JPL, and you know, at that point, we we were eight months into our studies related to Oumuamua, which you know, of course, it had been identified um, about one and a half years earlier as as you know, at the time, that was the first known interstellar visitor uh, to the solar system, and. You know, because of Oumuamua and, and our and our studies of it, this idea that that interstellar objects could carry, you know, unprecedented amounts of information about our, um, you know, local cosmic neighborhood and beyond, w was top of mind for both Avi and myself. And so, Avi and I had been sort of thinking about this possibility of, you know, how do we find others? To study, and this CNEO's database seemed promising. So, you know, within a matter of hours, maybe I think about a day, I had identified this this object, uh, which was which uh, struck off the coast of Papua New Guinea in January of 2014. 
I had identified it as a potential candidate to be an interstellar meteor. Um, and I emailed Avi right away, and he he suggested that I use the speed of the impact combined with knowledge of uh, you know how small body populations in the solar system move to try and get an estimate of the probability that it either originated from one of those populations or that it originated from elsewhere, you know, beyond the the solar system. And, you know, after I had contemplated that approach, I proposed a more precise method, you know, in which we could derive the object's trajectory, you know, using the altitude that it burnt, you know, the, the longitude, latitude, altitude, velocity components in, in the X, Y, and Z direction, and of course the date and time to run you know, time backwards and figure out the object's trajectory while accounting for all of the gravitational influences of the sun and the planets. And so Avi agreed with that proposal and I got to work. <laughs> and, you know, I ended up checking my work about 30 times because I just couldn't believe the results. Um, but, you know, after you know, teasing apart the effects of the Earth's motion around the sun and the meteor's um, motion relative to the Earth, I kept finding the same result that this object had a heliocentric speed of around 60 kilometers per second, which is well over the threshold, this, this local speed limit at, at the Earth's distance from the sun of about 42 kilometers per second to be bound to the sun. And I just kept getting the same result that this orbit was clearly unbound. And because it was so, you know, well over the threshold, this would remain the case even if there had been large uncertainty errors in, in the measurements. And so, you know, this, this was um, pretty shocking to me because people have been searching for interstellar meteors for decades. I mean, there's a great paper in 1950 that describes a search for, for interstellar meteors. So may have been, you know, could have even been uh, up to a century. But, but if these data were correct, then this would be the first interstellar meteor discovered and also the first interstellar object um, to ever be detected by humans. And, and this was sort of just hiding in plain sight. So the thing about the CNEO's database is that it does not contain measurement errors on the velocity components. And, you know, the reason for this is um, somewhat understandable. The measurements are made by classified U.S. government satellites that are designed to detect foreign missile launches. And so the U.S. government doesn't want adversaries to know exactly how precise their sensors are. So Avi and I sort of reversed engineered estimates of these classified satellites measurement errors as it pertains to fireballs by using independently verified data on other fireballs, taking those data and comparing them to the data in the CNEO's database and, and you know, other analyses done uh, throughout the scientific literature about these, these same sorts of um, tests. And after doing that sanity check, we were, we were left with the same conclusion that, you know, this is clearly an interstellar object. And so after that we submitted for publication and the journal referees wouldn't have it because you know they were they were uh upset about the unknown nature of the error bars so at that point we enlisted the help of uh two scientists at los alamos national laboratory um alan hurd and matt hevner they both had security clearances and they were both interested and in, in this sort of uh, collaboration between the public sector and and scientists to to promote blue sky uh, research, and Matt Hevner was actually able to get in touch with the 
anonymous analyst who had derived the meteor's velocity components from those classified satellite observations. And he was able to do so because from 2014 through 2018, he worked um, at the White House in the Office of Science and Technology Policy and trying to declassify uh, error bars related to CNEO's data was one of the areas that, that Matt had, had worked on during his time in the White House. So he was a perfect person for the job and and he was able to get a confirmation from the anonymous analyst that the uncertainties for the velocity components in the X, Y, and Z direction were each in no higher than uh, 10%, this you know fiducial upper bound that is probably way higher than the actual error bars, but but that was, you know, it's a value that that does not uh, compromise any national security matters. And and it was more than good enough for our analysis. So we, we plugged in uh, that value into our analysis. Um, and it implied an interstellar origin with 99.999% certainty. And um, at this point, we were feeling uh, pretty good about the discovery. Uh, but the paper was again turned down by by referees uh, because the confirmation had been a private communication with an anonymous U.S. government employee, but not an official statement from the U.S. government. And Matt Hevner had difficulty in procuring that. So, you know, after that, um, Matt worked with the editor of the journal to try and uh, identify someone within the government with the proper security clearances um, who also you know had a background in physics you know physics phd and therefore the qualifications to be able to review the claim internally and you know the idea is that this person would serve uh to to verify the claim without um without actually releasing the data and so they spend many months trying to identify such a person. I believe at some point they did because I remember getting an email um, either in late 2019 or early 2020 saying that, oh, the the referee was unable to travel to the secure location to review the data. And um, it was a whole saga, but eventually, um, you know, Matt Hebner and the journal referee you know, had to sort of reach a reach a dead end. So at that point, you know, we we thought that this this uh, discovery would would never be published in in a peer reviewed journal or you know confirmed by you know in, in an official way, and unfortunately had to move on to other research. But about a year later, we were approached by Pete Warden, who is the chair of the Breakthrough Prize Foundation. And he introduced us uh, to a fellow named Matt Daniels. And um, at the time, Matt Daniels was working for the office of the Secretary of Defense. And, you know, Matt came from a science and engineering background with a PhD at Stanford. Um, and, you know, at that point was working within government. And he had read our preprint um, about the meteor and wanted to help check within the U.S. government and see if he could get an official statement uh, about the true nature of this meteor, um, you know, put out. So he spent uh, the past year navigating, you know, many different levels of, of government bureaucracy. And, and just uh, this past month, he was able to procure official confirmation uh, from the Department of Defense. And so this this came from Lieutenant General John Shaw, who is the second in command um, at the US Space Command, and um, Joel Moser, who's the chief scientist uh, with a PhD in physics uh, of the Space Operations Command. And they verify that the data reported to NASA on the CNEO's database is sufficiently accurate to indicate an interstellar trajectory and, you know, finally confirms uh, the fact that this meteor was truly 
of Interstellar Origin. So that is the uh, the short version of what the past three years have been like. <laughs> now, let me ask you this. So we have one obvious case of an interstellar meteor, but in that data, were there other candidates? Yes. So, so there's actually one other candidate in the rest of the database. Um, it is closer to the 42 kilometers per second threshold. So it is, you know, less clearly interstellar. Um, so that's why, you know, we went with the, the case where it is much more uh, cut and dry. Now, if we had the uncertainties, we would be able to, you know, check whether the other one um, is is truly interstellar or not. And may, maybe in three years, the DOD will release another statement. But um, but yes, there, there's one more candidate. But but the fact of the matter is that this 2014 meteor is, you know, was way over the threshold. And as a result, you know, very clearly interstellar. Now, does the kinematics of the object's entry yield any information of about the system of origin? I mean, can we glean anything about where this thing came from, from just seeing it enter? We can, yeah. So um, there are a couple of things that are interesting about this object. I mean, the first one is is that it, it just had a high speed um, relative to the sun. Uh, you know, it was traveling at 60 kilometers per second when it hit the Earth, which which means that it sort of overtook the Earth from from behind because it, its Earth relative impact speed was closer to 45 kilometers per second. And what this means that it is that, you know, far away from the sun, uh, um, its velocity at infinity, as we call it, is, you know, more more like 40 kilometers per second. So that that was its its relative speed to the sun. But what's more instructive here is to compare this velocity vector to the typical velocity vector in our local neighborhood. And uh, this is called the local standard of rest or, or LSR. And, you know, we would expect um, objects to be relatively close to the LSR, you know, within one sigma or so. Uh, but it turned out that this object um, was 60 kilometers per second away from the local standard of rest. So that puts it at, you know, say, two sigma, give or take. And um, that is very surprising because, you know, that means that either this object came from a star that was just moving very fast relative to the local standard of rest. Like, for example, uh, a star in the thin di or the thick disk, rather, of the galaxy. But those stars make up, of course, a small proportion of uh, of local stars, you know, just a few percent. Or, you know, most interstellar objects we would expect come from the outer regions of other planetary systems. They're, you know, exo-oort clouds, um, icy spheres uh, of small bodies that, that exist at, you know, roughly half the separation, you know, or so, we think, uh, between stars, because objects in Oort clouds should be easily freed by the galactic tide and by interactions with passing stars. Um, but, you know, it is possible to achieve higher ejection speeds if you uh, are looking at objects that are deeper within planetary systems that um, leave due to, you know, say, getting kicked by a planetary scattering event. And, you know, it's possible that a high speed relative to the local standard of rest could have resulted from, you know, a, a kick like that, that was in the, you know, deeper interior of a planetary system. 
of a star that was moving much more typically relative to the local standard of rest. And, you know, in that case, we would expect the object to have a denser, less icy uh, composition. And, you know, that would also be much more instructive to our studies of exoplanets and and uh, planetary systems in general, but, you know, both in terms of comparing our own to others and, and sort of studying others in, in their own right. So it definitely wasn't a, a typical uh, interstellar object, whatever that means. Uh, but, but it, you know, it wasn't, it did not come in with the velocity components that we would expect. And we would expect velocity components that reflect, you know, some sort of typical local star. And there are questions about the composition of the object that entered the atmosphere. But before we get to that, and that's that's where the weirdness in this story starts. But before we get to that, interstellar objects seem to be very unusual <laughs> based on what we're seeing. So we see Oumuamua, and it displays characteristics that were very, very strange. Um, and it was at the time, you know, the first interstellar object we just we did we discovered. Now it's number two. Um, it seems like there's a lot about interstellar objects that we don't yet know, and that there, this is going to be a field that's going to yield a lot of surprises because it already has. <laughs> you know, the only boring interstellar object we've seen so far is Comet Borisov. So everything <laughs> else has been weird. Um, what? leads you to the conclusion that maybe we should go find this object. Yeah, so sort of as you mentioned, and now uh, Borisov, <laughs> the the only uh, example of an uh, interstellar object appearing, um, you know, like something that we would expect, is outnumbered. <laughs> so um, what's exciting about this object beyond you know its properties is the fact that it actually hit the earth so Amuamua and Borisov both you know came to our local vicinity um they they visited the solar system but they were moving extremely fast um that you know in order to catch up to them or to be able to intercept their trajectories we would have to have a you know, billion dollar space mission that was planned years in advance. And, and in fact, you know, as director of interstellar optics studies for the Galileo project, we are working with uh, Alan Stern, who was the PI of, of NASA's New Horizons mission on studying uh, the possibility of doing exactly that. But, you know, that's many years down the line and that will be, you know, some future interstellar object. But this 2014 meteor, because it was meteor, actually um, hit the Earth and rained down uh, fragments of material into the depths of the Pacific Ocean. And so, you know, in this case, nature has already done the work for us and and uh, going to search for any fragments or or. or melted uh, pieces of this object is going to be orders of magnitude cheaper than than the alternative you know a billion dollar space mission and um, you know if we do end up finding uh, some remnants of this object at the bottom of the Pacific Ocean that would represent the first time that you know humanity has encountered um, a piece of interstellar material that's larger than a dust grain and this would, you know, usher in an entirely new uh, era of of astronomy in which we're able to study exoplanetary systems, uh, you know, from actual samples that we would otherwise, you know, either have to, you know, intercept an interstellar object for uh, or travel to another star system uh, to get. And, and, and both of those are, are very hard to do, with the, with the latter being even um, harder. Now, given that you have two candidates, one really, really good one, one not so good, but still there, this seems to reflect that there is a large population of interstellar material passing through the solar system at any given time, especially small pieces like this. Um, and that, that that begs the question, 
is it possible that we already have recovered interstellar material sitting in our meteorite collections unrecognized? Oh, yeah, um, definitely. The, that's that's definitely a possibility. Um, now, of course, if we end up finding some material at the bottom of the Pacific Ocean, then we could immediately, you know, search all of the known meteorites and and see if if any of those match the composition of this one, um, and and perhaps we would find. Um, we would find an interstellar meteorite um, that's already in a collection. But um, you're exactly right. There are, based on this detection, we estimate that there are about a million of these objects per cubic AU. That means between us and the sun, there there should be a million of these meter-sized um, interstellar rocks. And it's just that you know, we don't have the technology to see them unless they're burning up in our own atmosphere. And and so it, it's kind of humbling in a way. And it, and it also tells us that, you know, there must have been many, many impacts uh, throughout Earth history. And there also has to be a lot of, us, you know, material ejected per star to fill this mass budget. It's interesting. The uh, the stars of the Milky Way are all sneezing on each other. Now, <laughs> the uh, this meteorite was not typical. And from the data that you have, it appears that the meteorite, instead of one big flash, it was detonating several times on the way down, creating multiple flashes, and did so at an unusual altitude. Can you give us a profile of, of what you can learn from about the material that this was made of from the data? Definitely. So um, Avi and I recently uh, published a research note um, in the American Astronomical Society uh, that analyzed the newly released light curve for this object, you know, in tandem with, with the Department of Defense's memo uh, that confirmed the interstellar nature of CNEO's 2014-0108. Um, they also uh, released a lot of light curve data, which which tells you the intensity uh, of the explosion as a function of time uh, for bolide throughout the catalog, and that included this object. And so we we analyzed this light curve, and it indeed had three separate flares, which, which indicate that uh, this meteor uh, underwent three gross fragmentation events, um, while you know, that means that material survived, um, in, you know, intact between these flares, which is which is surprising. And additionally, it it exploded very low in the atmosphere. And so from our analysis, um, it appears that the, these flares occurred at, you know, the last flare occurred at 18.7 kilometers, that was the reported altitude, and the first flare probably uh, a few kilometers higher than that, so at around 23 uh, kilometers. Um, all, so that means you know, these these all happened very low in the atmosphere, and um, we were also able to compute as a function of time the ram pressure that the object experienced in the atmosphere. And, you know, when the ram pressure exceeds the yield strength of a material, it breaks up and explodes. And so we were able to check the ram pressure at each of these flares. And it turns out that, uh, you know, flare one occurred at 113 megapascals of ram pressure. Flare two was at 145 megapascals. And flare three was at 194 megapascals. So that means that the yield strength of the material was likely somewhere between 100 and 200 megapascals. And, you know, this is somewhat surprising. Um, what we can say is that this implies that the CNEO's 2014-0108 was not a rock. 
um, rocky or stony meteorites have, have yield strengths uh, typically between one and five megapascals. So this is, you know, at least 20 times higher than that. And it certainly couldn't have been an uh, icy object. And in fact, you know, that uh, rules out all of the, um, or a composition for CNEO's 2014-0108 um, of the type that was proposed for uh, Oumuamua. So it, it rules out a nitrogen iceberg for this object. Uh, couldn't have been a hydrogen iceberg either. And it definitely could not have been a, you know, cosmic, uh, you know, dust bunny or, or fluffy dust aggregate. Um now, iron meteorites are the strongest ones that we know of, and they make up about 5% of observed falls. Now, the typical yield strength for an iron meteorite um, is about 50 megapascals. And so this object started to fragment um, at about twice that yield strength. And, and so this is very surprising. Um, and it implies that the object was was uh, not a rock, not an ice, um, but, you know, probably some sort of uh, metal. Now, given that it's metal, that makes it a little bit easier to find, right, on the ocean floor. So if it's, a an iron meteorite, then all you need is a magnet or some sort of sensing, you know, way to sense it and find it that way. Um but there's also a possibility that this is a pure metal, you know, something heavier, stronger than nickel iron in a meteorite, which would imply artificiality. Do you think that this could be uh, a techno signature? I mean, we're going to go and check, which I, which I think is the most exciting part of this, um, that unlike other interstellar objects, um, we actually have the opportunity and we have the technology to go over there and you know pull a magnetic rake so that's exactly what we're going to do and uh, probably in tandem with some other methods um but we're, we're going to um you know after we model every aspect of the fall and every aspect of the the winds that were um going on at the time and and also the the currents in the ocean that that were taking place at the time that could have carried these you know melted droplets, melted droplets uh, of metal to the ocean floor, um, and also, you know, the looking at local, um, you know, seismometer data to to triangulate the location to a higher degree of accuracy. After doing all of that, we are going to haul a ship over there and 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 rake the rake the ocean floor for these fragments, and so. You know, I'm excited to find whatever whatever we'll find. You know, since it was probably made of metal, you know, it will indeed be easier to to um, find with a magnet. Uh, but on the other hand, it'll probably be you know completely melted uh, droplets. Um, but yeah, it's 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 really exciting because we, we don't know what we're going to find um, if it's you know just a, a stronger iron meteorite than than um, is found in typical falls or if it's uh, or if it's you know something that we haven't seen in the solar system before. It'd be interesting because if 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 it is a stronger iron meteorite than what we see in the solar system. It could imply all kinds of things. For example, say it's part of a planetary core or something like that, where you get a different mix of metals than you normally do with nickel iron uh, meteorites in the solar system, which would make it an object unheard of here as as far as natural uh, materials go. Yeah, exactly. So this is going to be a direct probe of all sorts of <laughs> you know, branches of, of planetary science and exoplanetary astronomy. Um, and, you know, we're, we're going to, you know, if we find a piece of this thing, be able to say a lot about uh, planetary systems other than our own, whether, whether uh, Earth's structure and the structure of other uh, rocky planets and, and, and the cores of, of, of giant planets are, are similar to what we observe in, in our solar system and what that implies for, 
you know, everything ranging from, you know, planetary system assembly and architecture to um, hab- habitability. Uh, and, you know, it's it's a really exciting uh, era of, you know, new era of astronomy to be working in. And astrobiology, because one of the things that excites me about the finding of these objects and being able to directly analyze them in the laboratory could give us insight on things like the phosphorus problem, where we can try to figure out, you know, are there very, very phosphorus poor regions in the galaxy where it's there's just no chance of life arising? Or if we start seeing lots of phosphorus, then we know that, well, maybe it wasn't a problem, right? Exactly. Um, we, uh, when... Avi and I were chatting to the um, NASA scientist who is who is most uh, directly worked on expeditions like these. He said something to the effect of, you know, if we find something, this is going to be the most studied rock in human history. <laughs> and, and I think or, or piece of metal. I should amend that. This was before we analyzed the light curve. Um, so, yeah, just to second that, I, I think that if we do find something, this is going to be you know studied in extreme detail both for you know its astrobiological implications and for its you know exoplanetary implications for every last drop of knowledge that we can squeeze about um solar systems other than our own and it uh, there's another fun aspect of this too because sometimes interstellar objects can be captured and collect within the solar system. Now, within the Galileo project, is there any thoughts of, instead of a really high energy mission to catch up with one that's moving through the atmosphere very quickly, or or through the solar system very quickly, rather, and instead of doing that, just go to the collection point and take a look at what's there? Definitely, yeah, there's definitely been discussion of that. Um, You know, I wrote a paper in 20, I believe I wrote it in 2018 with with Avi on on this idea of of, of captured objects, uh, captured interstellar objects in the solar system. And now the the difficulty with this is that um, interstellar objects travel really fast, and as a result, we wouldn't expect. Um, you know, we initially thought that maybe there could be some some really large ones. Uh, that were were captured in in orbits within the solar system, but then you know it turns out these objects are probably going to be really tiny, and therefore um, very very hard to find. Um, probably as much effort as going after the bigger ones that are on unbound orbits, because you know at least we'd be able to see those. Um, so definitely an ongoing discussion, uh, but because of the you know high typical speed. Of, of these objects, um, it, it's difficult for the larger ones, which are more infrequent, to get captured uh, by the sun's gravity at a rate that will allow us to, you know, easily probe that population. Now, overall, now let's 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 go to the future. Fifty years from now, say, and we have a sampling of hundreds of interstellar objects sitting in our labs. And we can start to build a profile. Now, it's impossible, I guess, to actually trace an object back to its system of origin, you know, because the, the, the information just gets lost as things get perturbed and all that. But as a, a, the galaxy as a whole, if you have a huge sampling, you should be able to characterize the, the basically the geology of the galaxy from this eventually, right? Yeah, we, we'll be able to do interstellar geology or extrasolar geology, whatever you'd like to call it. But once we have a large sample size, we, you know, uh, from the kinematics of the objects, you know, you're able to probe the sort of kinematic origins and, and see what the range of ejection speeds and, and therefore ejection scenarios are. Uh, for these objects from the, from the mass profiles and abundance of the interstellar objects you're able to uh, gain insights into how uh, planetary system formation unfolds and and you know which, which provides uh, the sort of galactic census of these objects and then uh, from from the compositions we'll be able to you know once we have a large sample size um, 
you know, do do correlation studies with with the properties of, of stars in the galaxy and in our local environment. And, you know, for the first time in history, uh, do geology on <laughs> planets and solar systems, planetary systems other than our own. And it's worth pointing out here that geology and water go together. In other words, um, certain geology happens only in the presence of water. And so if you start finding materials that were blasted off an exoplanet that are affected by liquid water, then you're looking at an ostensibly habitable world that this, this originally came from. And that's on the table that we might find this, right? Definitely. Uh, water's on the table. So are, you know, interesting isotope ratios, especially if, you know, you have unmelted material, you can study oxygen isotope ratios, uh, compare them to those uh, from the solar system. Um, there, there are, you know, plenty of, of, of biosignatures that can, can be studied uh, through geology and, and through the analysis of, of, of these objects. So, um, you know, I think, I honestly think some of the biggest breakthroughs provided by this new field over the next several decades will be exactly as you say, um, habitability and astrobiological um, related discoveries because, you know, these give us direct probes of composition and that's not something that any other technique can give us. You know, we can get probes of atmospheric composition um, by looking at starlight as, as, as it diffuses through planetary atmospheres. But in terms of the actual material, this is it. Um, and so we're we're sitting at the precipice of this of this new era in which we'll be able to study these kinds of things. Now, a physics question and a crazy one. Um, so Earth, it's sitting here and it gets hit by asteroids. You know, one of them killed the dinosaurs. Is it possible to blast a rock? you know, an interesting rock off Earth in an impact at a velocity high enough to leave the solar system and go get deposited somewhere else? Certainly. So that's that's uh, one possibility that that a rock hits the Earth and then, you know, you get um, <laughs> you get small objects that that are above the escape speed of the solar system. And, you know, they they go off and, and you know, are potentially interstellar meteors on, on other worlds. Um, the other possibility, uh, w which I uh, propose in, in a couple of papers with Avi, you know, a couple of years ago, is that, so, so that, that that method of, of panspermia had, had been studied in the past, but I propose this new mechanism um, in which objects that are either interstellar or just sort of marginally bound uh, to the solar system. Um, so objects from the Oort cloud, uh, and then there's another category that I'll get into in a minute, but but either interstellar objects or marginally bound objects to the solar system can um, travel through Earth's atmosphere and get a gravitational kick from Earth at the same time. And, you know, I, if they're interstellar, continue on their merry way uh and if they are you know pieces of long period comets they can um you know get kicked out gravitationally from the solar system while you know retaining some changed composition or even material that was picked up um you know while grazing the earth's atmosphere um and then there's actually another category of objects that can graze the earth's atmosphere and leave which are um objects in for example um orbits that that will get perturbed into Jupiter crossing orbits because if you have a, a tighter orbit and you know for example the desert fireball network um, observed an object that was uh, in a pretty tight orbit then it it underwent a grazing event with the earth you know it passed through the earth's atmosphere which which you know added material and and certainly changed the surface composition of the object and after that, because of its gravitational interaction with the Earth, it was transferred into a Jupiter-crossing orbit, 
and it's you know very plausible once you're in a Jupiter crossing orbit that you get ejected from the solar system eventually. And so you can produce um, interstellar objects that that retain uh, compositional signatures of of the Earth, both by by having you know large impacts that that produce you know dust that that is moving really fast and and is able to escape dust or small fragments, or objects that that graze the Earth's atmosphere and then later leave the solar system. So it is marginally possible, and this is a total science fiction scenario just for fun, it's possible that there's an alien out there somewhere studying an Earth rock, wondering where it came from. Definitely within the realm of possibility, yes. And that brings us to another option. So Earth has, Earth's geology is such that it preserves a fossil record in stone, and sometimes very durable stone. Could fossils survive the interstellar medium from an exoplanet and, you know, answer our are we alone question just with a, you know, some analog of a clam in a, in a rock. Absolutely. So, you know, as they burn up um, in the Earth's atmosphere, you know, the larger an object is to start, uh, the, the more material that you're able to, you know, preserve because, you know, the outer crust ends up getting burnt in the atmosphere but the inner cores of 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 meteors um can can be preserved without much heating and as a result you can preserve whatever uh original composition was there so certainly you know if there's a you know biosignature of some sort and a previous interstellar uh, meteor then it's then it's somewhere on earth uh waiting to be found and you know, given the fact that this object showed up in a 10 year span of data, that that means that, you know, they're likely, let's say, you know, 100 billion order, you know, that order of magnitude uh, uh, of these objects probably hit the Earth in the past. So in, in the past. So our planet is definitely littered with with interstellar debris now whether that contains um secrets of of uh astrobiological implication that's remains to be seen but but it's definitely possible it really opens up the field um now we have certain areas on earth that function as collection points for meteorites and antarctica is a good a good example basically everything they, they fall on the glacier and get transported through glacial movement and deposited in one area so the scientists can go and pick up a whole bunch of meteorites of all different kinds of origins sitting right in one spot. This seems to me to be a good place to start looking for an interstellar object because you've got that that sort of collection effect, right? Definitely, yeah. We you know what's what's great about the this expedition beyond the fact of if we're able to find something and and analyze it for its own properties um, is the idea that once we know the composition of the first interstellar you know, confirmed interstellar meteor, we'll be able to know, you know, what kinds of things to look for, both in, you know, current meteorite collections and in terms of objects that are found at these these collection points. Um, and so this this is going to not only inform our understanding but also our future methods for for finding these things and this this gets me this gets me excited because we already know of some you know isotopically anomalous weird meteorites you know there there already are um ones that might be of of interstellar origin but meteorites are immensely interesting especially when you get into things like carbonaceous chondrites where you start finding amino acids and the building blocks of life and finding that on a galactic scale, you know, um, finding a carbonaceous chondrite analog that could have originated maybe halfway across the Milky Way, and it shows the same thing, tends to bolster the possibility that, you know, at least on a microbial level, the galaxy is pervaded with life. I think. Anyway. Exactly. 
Yeah, no, I mean, finding amino acids on an interstellar uh, meteorite would would be a uh, world changing um, discovery. And it's it's very possible, you know, well within the realm of possibility, um, mm-hmm. especially when you look at you know the nebulas and all that and you see these organic chemistry and everything it's it seems to be ubiquitous but i really wonder about phosphorus that's the one that that that's a sticking point with me. we will we will check for you john if we find it yes <laughs> please let me know <laughs> if you find phosphorus now the galileo project um an update what's going on and uh what preparations are being made to start collecting data yeah so uh the UAP branch, Unidentified Aerial Phenomena branch, is working hard on uh, the first uh, systems that, that are going to uh, collect data on the skies. And, uh, you know, both on the hardware branch and in terms of the, the software, the machine learning algorithms that are going to identify known objects and, and sort of filter them out and, and reduce the, the data stream. So, so that is well underway. And then in terms of the interstellar objects branch of the project, we uh, were able to secure, um, you know, about a quarter million dollars of Southwest Research Institute internal funding uh, for Alan Stern and a, a team of scientists there uh, to, you know, study the initial uh, parameters related to an interstellar object mission proposal. Um, something that you know we've done it in tandem within the Galileo project, uh, but more from a you know physics point of view. They're looking at it from a engineering uh, point of view, and uh, this is you know the the work from this study is going to go into an eventual proposal to uh, NASA or perhaps a privately funded mission uh, for a future rendezvous with. An interstellar object. So, uh, Galileo project is you know everyone is 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 working hard and um, you know exciting things are in the works. Now, what is the uh, the UAP detection um, experiments? What are those going to look like? I mean, what is it just going to be optical, or is there going to be other things involved? Yeah, I believe it's uh, I believe it's a combination of. Um, of, of many different types of, of sensors, both across the electro- electromagnetic uh, spectrum, but also, you know, infrasound. And, you know, the idea is that you want to be able to look um, for for signals in, in many different realms, because then, you know, it reduces your chance of having, you know, false signals and also allows you to say uh differentiate from you know a mirage uh or you know a laser being pointed at a cloud uh from you know actual objects so so that multispectral information and information that you know also is in the in the sound domain is important because it you know gives you gives you that that context so so i believe the the engineers are, are working hard on on integrating um all these types of sensors now do you think that um in in the filtering process you know obviously you need to be able to recognize you know a, a united airlines flight coming in from dallas or whatever and just filter that out because you're gonna see plenty of that stuff but is this or the sort of computer programs that are being written are they going to be able to detect weird atmospheric phenomena like ball lightning, natural things like that. And could atmospheric scientists use the data set to study that kind of stuff? Yeah, uh, for sure. So, I mean, it's, you know, we can train the data set on, you know, whatever, or we can train the algorithm on, on whatever data sets we have. And so that includes birds, planes, helicopters, drones. Um, but, you know, there, there certainly are other phenomena that, that um, you know may happen in the atmosphere and may ex- certainly explain um, you know maybe some some portion of of UAP sightings um, that you know we don't have robust data on and you know whether that's ball lightning or something else um, anything that's sort of unclassifiable that we don't have you know significant amounts of of training data to provide to the algorithm 
is um, going to fall out as a you know as a object that should be or or a phenomenon that should be uh, studied. So so the point of this this algorithm is is to filter out the boring stuff and and leave the more interesting stuff and sort of to reduce reduce the workload and you know i mean atmospheric phenomena are 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 i hope um one of the major contributions um of 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 the galileo project you know having having cameras on the sky multispectral information about the atmosphere in this way hasn't been done before uh, for the purposes of science. And and so, you know, I am very optimistic about um, contributions that can that can be made to um, atmosphere, you know, the, the study of the atmosphere and, uh, you know, more more rare phenomenon. I think it would be absolutely amazing and poetic if you caught an interstellar meteorite entering on a camera that was looking for UAP <laughs> and you were <laughs> yeah. able to recover it. <laughs> That's right. So that's some of the that's some of the crossover uh, that actually is is the point of crossover between the two branches. Now, you know, obviously, when you're looking for UAP, you do want a large field of view, um, but you also need a lot of, you know, multi spectral um, information and and all of that. But but with interstellar meteors, you know, as long as, you know, you could just you could just set up honestly like really cheap cameras um as long as you have a lot of them <laughs> and you're able to triangulate uh the meteor's trajectory because meteors are bright and um you know as long as you're able to get the velocity components you know by having more than one station you're good um of course if you want to do spectroscopy that adds complications but the other the other um consideration here is that meteor meteors typically burn up very high in the atmosphere so each station can see you know a lot of sky and so i hope that you know whether it's through the galileo project or or some future initiative we can um build a network of cameras that is really tailored to finding interstellar meteors so these are going to be uh really cheap low-tech stations um with you know, designed such that you have, you know, parallax measurements. So you, you have, you know, one or two stations per. But but these don't have to be overcomplicated. The 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 key here is having enough ground coverage that we can expect a, a detection of an interstellar uh, meteor. And right right now, um, most meteor networks are are fairly small in terms of atmospheric area. Uh, we just need to we just need to supersize it. Now, what can you learn, uh, you know, interstellar or or solar system? Either way, what can you learn by studying um, the meteors as they fall, as they're actually falling through the atmosphere? Can you point a spectrometer at that thing and characterize its composition that way without ever actually having to find it? Yeah. So that. That's that's the big advantage. And so, in 2019, Avi and I proposed, um, you know, when we proposed this this network of of uh, cameras that search for interstellar meteors, we noted that even if you're unable to recover the object, if you point a spectrometer as, you know, at the trail of light as it's burning up, you know, this will encode information about the composition of the object, and um, and you can look for you know all, all types of sort of uh, spectra in there and and you know that's it's a really exciting way um especially if these if these interstellar meteors are smaller because smaller ones are more abundant and and perhaps um they won't make it to the ground like CNEOs 2014 um it's a really exciting way to study their composition without having to rely on uh follow up uh, work, you know, looking for pieces on the ground. And with, with dust, you know, essentially interstellar dust, 
the population of that has to be absolutely enormous. So this is something that you might see very regularly is, uh, you know, instead of an interstellar meteorite, just an interstellar meteor. And that mm-hmm. could be something so populous that it's, it just happens all the time. And that people people right now, when they see a meteor fall in, you know, in, the, in the night, they can look at it and say, I wonder where that came from, you know? Yes. All right, Amir, it was good to talk to you again, and we'll check in again with you soon when uh, when the next paper comes out. Great chatting with you, as always, John. Thank you. Event Horizon and my channel are now available as a podcast on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and YouTube memberships. Early ad-free episodes, bonus episodes, and sleep-focused content. Sign up now by clicking the links below to your platform of choice.